our lives. I wanted to talk to you today about God's amazing message. Now I have to give props to a friend of mine, Mark Posey. He's a preacher in the area. And he gave me the, the, the skeleton of this sermon. We share a lot of sermons. And he gave me the skeleton for this about God's amazing message. Now we think about God's amazing message when you look at God's amazing message at the beginning of Hebrews. What does it say? God who at various times and divers manners spoken to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by Jesus. And that's where God's message comes from. And then we think about Jesus on the plains or on the mountain, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus was there giving the, the very constitution of what was going to be Christianity. And Jesus was opening up the, the, the message of God's, of God's amazing message to everyone where it was kind of broken up and not given to everyone. And that amazing message has been passed on to us through the scripture today so that we can be a part of it. Now when we start the kind of message, I want you to turn over to Ephesians. Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, we're going to start looking right at the beginning of the chapter, talking about God's amazing message. I want you to read with me Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And it says there, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also... We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. The first amazing thing about it is the amazing depth. The amazing depth. That I was dead in my sins and trespasses. And God reached down to pick me up, so to speak. God put his hand into the depths of my depravity to pull me out. How wonderful is that? That there I was, dead in my trespasses. Jesus said in Luke 19, 9 and 10, He said, Today salvation has come to this house because he also was the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. You remember that? When Jesus was at the house of Zacchaeus, and Jesus said, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to this house because I came not to seek those that are well, but to seek those that are sick. Salvation has come to this house. Jesus reached down. Because of the message of God, Jesus was able to reach down and to lift that man up. To lift him up because he was lost and now he's found. That's part of the amazingness of the message of God. That we are dead in our trespasses and sin, and yet God still reaches down to pick us up. How glorious is that? When you turn over to Romans 3.23, it's a verse we love to quote. It's a verse we almost all know by heart. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's us. Look what Paul says there in Ephesians. Read it at the beginning of verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. We were part of that, that, that group that was lost. And Paul's talking to Christians there. And he's telling those Christians there in Ephesus, you were part of the group that was lost. You were part of the group that was wayward. But no more. Because the part of God's amazing message is that He took us out of our sins and trespasses. How deep, holy, the holy God has to reach down into to get us out of that. It's a wonderful feeling. Just knowing that God's reaching down for us. If you turn over to Colossians, and look at Colossians 2, 13 and 14, it says there, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, 
having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having it nailed it to the cross. So we can never express how deep we are in our depravity. In fact, we can barely even comprehend how deep we are in our depravity because it goes so deep. It's like trying to find a vein of gold. You can't hardly find it because it's so deeply embedded in the rock sometimes. And that's our depravity, our sin. So deep within us that God had to reach into the depths of that sin to pull us out. And that's part of the, the, the majesty and the glory of the message that God was able to reach in and pull us out. It is only because of His great mercy and the love He has for us that He provided a way out for us. And that's what He talks about next. When you keep going into Ephesians 2, and you read from Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, it says there, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love which, which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, alive together, with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. That in the age to come. He might show the exceeding riches. Of his grace. In his kindness. Toward us. In Jesus Christ. Although there was an amazing depth. To the message of God. That God was able to reach down. Into our depravity. And pull us up. Look there. He's talking about the amazing height of the love of God. That God, because of Jesus, has lifted us up to be his sons. Jesus said in John 12, 32, If I, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. And that's exactly what happened. When he was raised on that cross, now all men are able to take and partake of the heights of love of the God because of Jesus on the cross. God has raised us up through the sacrifice of Christ so that we might end up being heirs with him on the throne, heirs with him in heaven as sons of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, it says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Have you ever thought about that? Paul says the fact that Christ was raised assures us of who we are. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then what we're saying is empty. He goes on to say, and if he's not, we're to be most pitied. Because we're fooling ourselves. Or we're liars. One of the two. It is the raising of Christ which has, which has moved us into a relationship with God that took us from those de that depth of the trespasses of our sins, the uncircumcision of our, of our heart. Not our flesh, but our heart and circumcised our heart so that we might be raised up with Christ in the last day. Just as Christ came out of the tomb, one day we too will come out of the tomb because of God's amazing message. That's part of the message, that we will be raised together. In Galatians 3.22 it says this, But the scripture has confined all under sin, that's us, all under sin, that the promise by the faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now you might have a King James Version. And if you look there, King James Version actually says, but the scripture is confined all under sin, that the promise by the faith of Jesus Christ. Some of the newer versions change it from of Jesus Christ to in Jesus Christ. Because they're trying to tell you that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you will be raised from the dead. Some of the original translations say the faith of Jesus Christ. And it was because of the faith of Jesus Christ that he went to the cross. 
It was because of the faith of Jesus Christ. He was able to sit in the garden and say, Not my will, Father, but your will be done. It's because of the faith of Jesus Christ he was able to take the beating, to take the cross, to take the nailing, to take the, the agony of the death and the separation from God. It's because of the faith of Jesus Christ for leaving heaven on our behalf that we can be saved. It's the faith of Jesus Christ that makes the difference in our lives, that raises us to the heights of glory. It was the sacrifice of Jesus that provided the blood by which we have been cleansed. The sacrifice of Jesus that, that provided the, the blood that washes us clean of our sins, put them so that we might be able to stand on the sea of glass one day and sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And praise His holy name. That's part of the, the, the heights of the message of God. If you keep going and you look in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says there, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. We've looked at the fact that the message had an amazing depth. That Jesus and God reached down into our trespasses and sins to save us. We looked at the fact that the message had, a, had, had, had an amazing height to it. That we've been made alive and heirs through Christ. When you look at this, you see, if nothing else, the amazing grace of the message. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How true is it that I was once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That I was blind because I couldn't see the truth of our life is to serve God. That I was blind because I couldn't see the truth that I'm destined for destruction without God. It's because of the grace of God only because of the grace of God that we do not deserve or that we do not receive the destruction that we deserve. When you look at John 4.10, Jesus says there, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There he is. Jesus, sitting on the side of the well when the Samaritan woman comes up to him and he says, give me to drink. And he uses that opportunity to teach her a truth. To teach her a truth that there is a living water that can save us and redeem us from our sins. And it's not something that we can earn, ever. We can never earn it. If we try to earn it, we're already failing. Paul said in Romans 5.15, But the free gift is not like the offense. For it's by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to the many. We look back to Adam. And we see the fact that when Adam sinned, along with Eve, there just, it just wasn't one of them, it was two of them. But we look back and we see that when they sinned, they condemned the entire race. Condemned the entire race by that sin. Now we don't carry the burden of their sin, but we carry the burden of our sin. And we recognize our sin. And the only way we can get out from underneath our sin is by the one man, Jesus Christ. Through whom we have been saved. And when you think about the grace of God sending Jesus Christ, really and truly, who's Jesus Christ but a part of God? A part of the Lord came to this earth that we might be saved. Jesus Christ. That's what it is to be abound to many. That gift that God gave us, the grace that God gave us, abounds to us all through Jesus Christ. 
and the faith he had to serve his God, as a, to, to be a servant to his God, our God. That's part of the message, that the grace that God has given helps us not get what we deserve. Because the truth is what? What do we deserve? Destruction. That's what we deserve. That's what we deserve. 2 9, it says this. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. It was a plan that God had in place from the very beginning. And God manipulated the plan in such a way so that the proper time and in the proper place and in the proper manner, Jesus came forth. So that he might could walk down the side of the Sea of Galilee at one point and John say, Behold the Lamb of God. Because it was only by the blood of the Lamb of God that we have redemption from our sins. Only by the blood of the Lamb of God. It's the only way we got there. And that lamb was slain for us so that we might have grace, access to the grace. We've got choices before us, heaven and hell. That's the choices before us. We like to think that we're free agents. Well, we are. But in the end, there's only one choice you can make that makes any difference, heaven or hell. And it's only by the free gift of God through His grace toward us that we have the ability to opt out of hell. And that free gift, that grace that He gave is manifested in Jesus Christ. That's where it manifests. Keep looking on. Right there at the last verse, right there of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And there it says in, t in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Of all the amazing things about God's message, the, 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 the amazing depth that God reached down to take us out of, the amazing height that God has raised us to in Christ, and the amazing grace that we've been given through Christ. We're also an amazing workmanship. You ever thought about that? We were made. We were something, and then we became something else. More than once you get the idea of, of there being great vessels and, eat, and, and, and common vessels in the house of God. More than once in the scriptures you get that idea. We were made, made as his workforce. John 3, 6 and 7, Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. When we talk about being created in Christ, we're talking about becoming a new creature, becoming something different than what we were. And Jesus tells Nicodemus in this place, don't be amazed that I tell you you're going to have to become something new. That's something that they were, that they were failing to, to understand under the old law, that they were supposed to become something different, supposed to become something new. That's part of what Jesus came to help them understand, was that they were going to become something new, something beautiful. Through the Spirit. And he says, don't marvel at the fact I'm telling you you must be born again. That's nothing more than him saying, you've got to change your heart. You've got to change who you believe you are. In Galatians 6.15 it says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but a new creation. Paul is making a, uh, making a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And we get that. We understand the physical nature of that. But he's saying, beyond that is the new creation in Christ. 
that circumcision means nothing. Who we are in the flesh means nothing if we are not a new creature in Christ. If we're not that new creature, that new creation in Christ, we're lost. We're still dead in our trespasses. If we haven't become that new creature in Christ that Jesus told, was telling Nicodemus he needed to be, still lost in our trespasses and sins. Romans 12, 4 and 5, it says, For as many have members, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, the church, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are one body. And the head of that body is Christ. When we become the workmanship of God, we become members of that one body in Christ. And that's where we want to be with our lives, in the one body of Christ. Because that's where salvation is. That's where the beauty is. Now when we talk about that message of God, this is really where it gets really neat. There's an interesting word that we use in, in, when you talk about Bible and Bible things. It's called a theophany. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Theophany. And when you have a theophany, what you're talking about is the presentation of God to man in some form or the other. The presentation of God to man. One of the most important theophanies that you can remember. Moses standing on the plain, taking care of sheep. He sees a bush burning. He says, I'm going to go turn aside and go see what wonder this is. This bush that burns but is not consumed. And when he gets up there to the bush, what happens? The voice comes out of the bush. Take off your shoes because you are on holy ground. God presented himself to Moses in the form of a burning bush. How glorious is that? And think about the fact that because God presented himself in that bush, because that was a theophany of God, think of all the wonderful things that happened after that. Moses goes to Egypt, delivers the slaves, takes them out, leads them to the promised land. There's another theophany, a big theophany, if you think about it, in the fact that the Christ came to this earth. The Christ. God incarnate was his name. Emmanuel, God with us, came to this earth. The man Jesus Christ was a theophany. He represented, when you looked at Jesus, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When you've seen me, you see God. Because Christ was a theophany. He was a representation of God on earth. When Jesus spoke, God spoke. That was the nature of it. And when you think about what the beautiful things that, that were heralded by Christ coming to this earth, our salvation, our raising up from the depths of our sins, the promise that one day we will be raised like Him forevermore to live in heaven. What a beautiful theophany. You know, some people say theophanies have stopped. And I kind of wonder about that. Because it seems like to me there's one more theophany. One more representation of God on this earth. And brothers, sisters, it's us. The church. We're the theophany of God. When people from the outside look to see who God is, they look to us. They look to the fact that we are on this earth, here now. It says in John, how will they know that you love one another? Except, or how, do you, how will they know you're my disciples except that you love one another? We are the manifestation now of God on this earth. 
We should be what people look to and say, God is there because of the love we have for one another. God is there because of the concern we have for one another. God is there. That's what they should be saying about us. Michelangelo was once asked about a piece of rock he was chipping on, a piece of marble. And he's chipping away, little bits falling away. And I said, what are you doing, Michelangelo? He said, I am liberating the angel in this stone. I'm liberating the angel in this stone. And when you think about it, that's what the message of God does for us. When we talk about the message of God and how it affects our lives, that message liberates us from this world. The message of God liberates us from what we were making us into something new. Making us into the glorious body of Christ. Making us into each and individual light shining in a world of darkness. Last thing I want you to notice. Twice in the reading between Ephesians 1 to 2, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, twice in that reading, it talks about being in Christ. In verse 6, it says, It raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And again, in verse 10, when he says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Ask yourself, how do you get into Christ Jesus? How do you get into Christ Jesus? Because that's where we want to be. If we really want to be the people of God, we want to be in Christ Jesus. If we really want to be the people who go to heaven, we want to be in Christ Jesus. We want to be part of His body. That's what we want to be. You know, every time in the Bible it talks about getting into Jesus Christ, it's always associated with baptism. Every time. When you look at Romans 6, 3, it says, we were baptized into Christ because we were baptized into His death. Because baptism puts us into Christ as part of His death. In Galatians 3, 27, it says we were baptized into Christ. Those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You want to be in Christ? Baptized into Christ. That's how it works. Colossians 2, 11 and 12 talks about being baptized. Talks about being buried in baptism to be raised in Christ. Almost even more specific to the fact that when we are buried with Christ in baptism, we are raised to walk in newness of life. The importance of baptism cannot be understated. That is so true. But the importance of continuing to walk in Christ cannot be understated. It's a process. It's a process by what we live. 